we've heard some very uplifting um, presentations this morning, the empowering and the transformative nature of the internet, how it's changed our lives you know, for the best. Uh, my presentation is going to completely deflate you and pour cold water on the whole thing. I've entitled the presentation The Fragile Internet. Can you see that up on the screen, first slide? Yeah. Um, I'm a guy that's known for living on the edge. And while I'm not going to inflict on you death by PowerPoint today, I'm going to give you a variant of that. It's called death by keynote. And the living on the edge is this is the first time I'll confess to using an iPad in a presentation. So you'll have to bear with me. We're going to just see how fragile my own understanding of technology is today. And if it all fails, I'll claim now that it just proves my point. But really, when we talk about the fragility of the internet, I, I think of it in three major dimensions. Um, the first is the quality of openness of the internet. This is obviously a major contributor to the strength and the power of the internet itself, is the fact that it is open, it is cross-jurisdictional, and it is not subject to any centralised command or control structure. Um, that, I say, is under a degree of threat, and we certainly should not be taking that for granted. The second attribute, working in the anti-clockwise direction, is the infrastructure of the internet itself. And here I argue, and there have been examples, unfortunately, both in Australia and overseas in the last few years, that demonstrate the inherent fragility of both the underground and also the mobile uh, components that give us internet today. And uh, I will give you some examples of that just to illustrate. And the third element is the one that I'm really going to focus on today, and that is the whole element of trust and confidence, which underpins all our activity online. And I put it to you that without that essential element there, then everything else is really academic. You can have the best infrastructure in the world, uh, you can have uh, the fastest broadband in the world, but if people uh, don't trust what's going to happen to their own uh, identity, their privacy, and I know Dave McClure, who will speak after me, will address this, if they don't um, feel safe with the sanctity of their own financial information, then I would argue that we, will, we, we could reach a tipping point where levels of uptake and adoption start to tail off as people to perform their own risk assessment and say, you know, it was probably safer, not as convenient, but probably a lot safer to go and walk into a bank and do a teletransaction or do something else offline. So that is the general theme. Now, on the trust and confidence issue, I'm going to talk a little bit about the whole zombie botnet phenomenon which is really, I would say, one of the major contributing factors to the undermining of trust and confidence, or at least the potential undermining of it. The reality is that most users don't know that this exists. So at the moment, they're living in um, something of an ignorant oblivion, ignorant oblivion of, the, of the risk that they're actually facing. But again, once that risk starts to manifest in actual uh, compromises, then I think we are potentially going to face a crisis of confidence. And as an industry, therefore, I would argue we bear the onus um, of preparing ourselves and conditioning our networks as best we can to be as resilient as possible to that, event, that possibility. When we look at the threats to openness, um, they come from two potential directions, one from government and one from uh, the other from corporations. The example of government I will give you shortly sh uh, talks about how governments feel threatened by the open nature of the internet and will attempt to shut it down. Corporations, we've seen, and you know, you've heard me talk before about the whole war that we've had with the copyright sector, and uh, you know, the, the dialogue, the dialectic seems to be shifting towards um, shutting down users um, and also now shutting down websites and requiring ISPs, in fact, to block access to certain websites because they're allegedly facilitating file sharing, for instance, or downloads. Um, anyway, this is not really the theme for today, but I just wanted to make sure for the sake of completeness that I cover that off, just to illustrate that we should not be complacent. The other element is in terms of the, uh, both the infrastructure and it impacts on trust and confidence, 
the uh, effect of natural disasters, and of course in the security space, the combined effect of hackers, organised crime and potentially terrorists as well. And, and what we've seen in the last few years is actually a convergence of those elements, utilising very similar, if not the same, techniques. Uh, and in, in some cases, collaborating um, to um, enhance their uh, capability for attack. Now, just moving to uh, the question of openness, um, you'll recall earlier this year, I think it was the 28th of January, in fact, um, that's a actual photograph of the riot police in Cairo attempting to shut down a public presentation. But if you, re if you can read the text, it says that organisations that track global internet access detected a collapse in traffic into and out of Egypt on around 10.30 GMT Thursday night. The shutdown involved the withdrawal of more than 3,500 BGP routes by Egyptian ISPs. 88% of the Egyptian internet access was successfully shut down. So, you know, the, 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 this is not fear-mongering. I mean, we are seeing actual examples of particularly totalitarian regimes feeling threatened by the openness of the internet. We know of many other jurisdictions, and in fact, that incident was not lost on many other foreign governments. And in fact, um, it gets even worse. I'm not sure if you can identify the um, simulated character in that that um, image there, but, um, and, and thankfully the legislation never succeeded, but there was actually a bill presented last year that effectively gave the US administration uh, the kill switch for the internet in the US. So I think all I'm saying is and there may be very legitimate reasons why governments believe that they need to have this power, but as an industry and as a transformative industry that is empowering so many people, we need to ensure that the uh, proportionality will prevail and that we don't start to see a growing momentum for governments to assume greater and greater control over the internet because I think that in the long run um, it, it is subject to abuse and, and governments of all um, persuasions are not generally amenable to external scrutiny. And I think we've been observing the debate in South Africa around the information bill as an example of just how that can manifest on the ground. So without labouring the point, I just really wanted to say this quality of openness that is so fundamental to the internet as we know it is, is like a flower and it should not, to, to, to pick up on um, Jack's natural analogy, I mean, we can't assume that these things that are, that are beautiful and captivating are not also delicate and susceptible to destruction. Um, the, you're aware of the Open Net initiative, no doubt it's a collaboration of some of the major universities, Harvard, Cambridge, Oxford, as well as some private, private sector organisations, and sponsored also by George Soros. Um, but they're committed to monitoring uh, the attempts of governments around the world to uh, filter or control the internet. This is a map here, a geopolitical map, showing um, jurisdictions in which uh, content relating to conflicts, border disputes, separatist movements and militant groups is being controlled, online content that is, and uh, the darker the colour, the worse, according to OpenNet, the degree of control. You can see that, you know, if you take a uh, look at Russia as well in that, in Eastern Europe, you're talking about, um, well, from a geographic standpoint, almost half the world. If you add to that the, the, the map on uh, controls over political speech, similar types of countries, and again, a similar um, distribution of control there. And again, where this is quite broad. It also covers um, speech relating to uh, freedom of expression itself, minority rights and religious movements. Um, and finally, um, OpenNet has done an interesting map on social controls, and here the, the um, map is far more pervasive and you can see even countries like the US and Australia and Canada um, susceptible to forms of regulation relating to the internet um, that, that deal with what you might call the more mor moral issues. And this is certainly an issue we've had as an ongoing um, area of 
I suppose, conflict with the Australian government and uh, it's one that uh, thankfully I no, no longer have to deal with. But um, it, 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 I'm, I'm very familiar with um, the intentions behind the move and really the justifications all seem quite plausible. The problem is in the implementation and how you control the accountability within that implementation. Australia does not yet have the mandatory filtering that has been promised and is still official government policy. And just by way of update, the new Senate, which took its place in July, the numbers are now such that that legislation is unlikely to pass. So we've had another reprieve, but I can tell you that in the 13 and a half years that I ran the Internet Industry Association, we dealt with this issue no le less than five times. So it's like the Dracula that refuses to die. And a lot of it's driven by the media, I hate to say, but there is that dynamic in some countries where you get the media uh, sensationalising incidents and then you get a political knee-jerk reaction. And if you live in a country such as Australia where the processes of legislation are such that you don't have, uh, well, as let's say opposed to the US where you have um, more tighter controls on how legislation gets through and presidential vetoes and so on, it is, you can actually see Western democratic nations moving to control the net in ways that would have been unthinkable to us when the internet first began. So openness is fragile. Infrastructure, just quickly, I don't have any um, textual slides, but here's just some few, a few visual examples of the kind of things that we're talking about. Um, hurricanes, I don't think are necessarily a substantial risk in South Africa. Uh, I think you have to be in a certain area of the world, but we, in Australia we had Hurricane or Cyclone Yazi in uh, February, I think it was this year, right after the floods in Brisbane. The, the state had only just recovered from the worst floods since 1974 when this hurricane came through, took out mobile towers, and um, people were stranded without any form of communication for literally weeks in some cases. So. Um, again, it's, it, you know, we take these things for granted, but how reliable are they? In circumstances, I might add, where climatologists are telling us that global weather conditions are going to become more extreme. If you add to that, then the, the, the flood situation, again, we, we saw floods not just in Australia, but last year in uh, Nashville, Tennessee, um, and in Karachi, shocking, devastating floods in Pakistan and in 2007 in um, the UK. And in all cases, we saw ISPs reporting that they had major outages that in some cases, well, in the case of Brisbane this year, it took them a couple of weeks before they could even get to the flood of exchanges. There was no accessibility there. So we had people without any form of uh, telephony or internet access. And, and the irony is that they are the people that actually in a disaster situation are the ones that are in most in need of communications facilities. Uh, in last year, or in 2007, Victoria in Australia had one, one of the worst bushfires ever. I think 230 people were killed. It was Black Saturday. And again, you have infrastructure that was brought down, people isolated, unable to communicate with family or friends or relief workers. And it just shows you the susceptibility of uh, environmental damage to the infrastructure. Now they've instituted an SMS warning system so that if there is any threat of possible bushfire in Victoria, they've got the cooperation of a, the two or three major mobile carriers that have all agreed to send um, pre-evacuation SMS messages to the citizens to give people time to get out. And what they learned from this, these bushfires was a lot of people weren't sure when the appropriate time to leave was, and a lot of people were actually killed on the roads trying to get out when trees would fall across and they couldn't get their cars through. So again, communications is fundamental. This one, I think, is a little bit ironic, but that's New York, the New York floods of um, pick your favourite disaster movie. Um, but again, you know, the, this consequence of ri rising sea levels and uh, environmental change will have major bearings on uh, our internet infrastructure. And I think the key takeout is that as much as we believe our, our infrastructure to be uh, resilient, and survivable and redundant, we, we have to, I, I think, rethink that now in circumstances where climatic um, events like these 
are going to occur with increasing frequency. I also am aware, and this is not just in South Africa, but we've had a lot of theft of infrastructure um, from human um, disasters, if so to speak, that are actually going and pulling out copper because of the high price of copper now. Uh, I think you guys told me about this, this incident where you would go into a pit, pull out some copper, tie it around the tow bar of a car and drive down the road, and then, you've, you know, 10 minutes later, you've got half a tonne of resaleable copper. And I think Ant was meant to be on a conference call with us earlier this year, and he didn't have any mobile reception, presumably because the tower had been stolen, or parts of the components, at least. So, you know, we're very aware of the fact, and you will be too, that the infrastructure is not something that you can take for granted. Now, the main... Um, Emphasis, though, today I want to talk about this trust and confidence issue. In particular, um, the record of the internet in 2011 was awarded the Epic Fail um, Award from Hacker Magazine. They documented 32 different cases. This is so far this year, and it's still only, what, September. 32 major incidents, starting with the RSA hack in March, where you had the secure ID tokens were compromised, um, allegedly by the Chinese. Uh, they thought the motive was some form of espionage. Um, I've got a few of these documented. You'll know many of these yourselves. But um, also in March, the Komodo hack, where the digital certificate certifying authorities were hacked, and um, the certificates that were used to validate sites were all compromised. And were they not regenerated, it would have been very easy for people to spoof websites. And of course, that's how a lot of the um, financial fraud will take place. Um, in also in April, uh, we had Lulsec attack, uh, doing a DDoS attack on the Sony PlayStation network. 77 million people, account holders, had their account information stolen, all, right from usernames and online handles all the way through to credit card information. 77 million people, that's three times the population of Australia in one incident. Uh, the FBI was hacked in June. Um, again, usernames and passwords. It wasn't the FBI, it was actually InfraGuard, their partner. Um, but um, confidential information relating to operational staff was compromised so that they no longer had that operational um, uh, an anonymity. Citigroup was hacked in June. Also in June, Lulsec again attacked the CIA this time with a, another DDoS attack bringing down the CIA's website. Apart from anything else, it would have been hugely embarrassing, don't you think? In, in August, McAfee documented um, that 72 public and private sector organisations in 14 countries had been compromised, uh, entailing compromises to customer accounts of millions and millions of people. And the list goes on. I mean, that's, what, six out of the 32 that were documented so far this year. And so um, you might agree that the epic fail tag is possibly warranted. Uh, so that's sort of the bad news, but it gets a little bit worse. The, the increasing sophistication of botnets is really the name of the game here. And this is where I've been in Washington last week in meetings at the White House and um, with the Senate Committee on Homeland Security, and the thing everyone is worried, terrified about are the botnets. And here's an example. The Mariposa botnet uh, was active in 2009. It was finally brought down last year. Compromised 12.7 million hosts. 800,000 users in 190 countries were compromised. <coughs> And the key point is this, and I'm sure many of you know this, that the hacker tools that are available these days enable unskilled um, cyber criminals to inflict major damage and, and loss, way out of proportion to their own technical capability. And beyond anything, it's a persistent and dynamic threat. What's unique about Mariposa was that the actual payload actually is, is encrypted and it can morph over time, so that today it can be um, a virus engine, tomorrow it can be turn your computer into a spam bot and the day after it can turn it into a DDoS attack machine. And so the traditional antivirus signature technology which is used to identify the actual malware is rendered not very helpful. Out of the 41 AV products and services that potentially would have 
tractors, only six were successful initially because of the fact that it keeps changing its character. It's like a virus in your body that keeps uh, morphing into a new and new form so the immune system can't shut it down. And this is exactly the way in which this whole uh, botnet phenomenon is going, which is why we say we, we almost need to take an epidemiological um, approach to uh, malware identification and remediation. And I can talk more about how we brought an AIDS researcher to an internet security conference in May this year and he talked about the lessons that he learned uh, trying to educate and change behaviour amongst the risk groups within the AIDS community. Uh, and I think there are a lot of parallels. I mean, not a single IT professional in that room left the room without fully understanding the crossover between the kind of risk behaviours that we see in the health area and the risk behaviours that we see when the same people get behind a computer. Because they are the same individuals. And, and the key take out from the presentation from the AIDS researcher is we can't target one standard set of messages to everyone and say, this is what you have to do. They said they, had to, they soon realised that there were subgroups, different risk profiles within the potential community that were affected, and you had to take completely different approaches to how you communicate the security messages to them. Or not the security, the, um, the health messages. But I'd say the same thing would apply here. Um, at the enterprise level, we've now seen the, uh, the rise and it's been given the name Advanced Persistent Threat. This is where the malware sits low and deep inside the organisation. In many cases, it's not doing anything. It's just watching what's going on. And uh, the main game here is theft of intellectual property. And this is in my discussions with the US officials last week, and our, our own officials in Australia would say the same thing. It's the theft of corporate intellectual property that represents the greatest new development and potential risk to the entire economic base. Because when you think about, in our case, we've got mining companies that are supplying critical um, strategic resources to developing countries and they are experiencing literally hundreds of hacking attempts a day to steal the pricing information prior to the price negotiations going for next year's supply contract. So there is a huge asymmetry now in the way in which negotiations are occurring around critical commodities. Food will be the same and you could pick any resource now if, if your adversaries have got inside information as to the uh, approach, the, your bottom line on pricing, any of that kind of stuff, not to mention plans, diagrams, know-how, uh, weapons information, the list goes on and on. And, and what, are, what are the vendors saying now? They're saying the day of the firewall is sort of ending. You've got to assume that they are already in your network. And now the game is about monitoring what they're doing trying to see what parts of the information base they're interested in and then developing risk strategies specifically directed to your most valuable information. So it's a much more sophisticated defence play now than we've ever seen before. Now, that's the bad news. The good news, and I never like to finish a talk with doom and gloom, it's always good to leave people with some hope. So there's some hope. Uh, in Australia, I spoke last year about the iCode. At the time, it was pre-implementation, right? We'd just launched it in June, and we were giving ISPs a six-month window to gear up to start doing this zombie botnet <coughs> mitigation on their network. Just to recap, the, what is the iCode? It's a voluntary code of practice for Australian ISPs to mitigate sorry, zombie botnet activity. Voluntary code of practice. Now, that's what the front page looks like. It has four main elements. The ISPs that are complying with it agree to firstly detect botnet activity as best they can on their network. Then they will in some way attempt to notify the end user that they've been compromised. There are escalation processes within the iCode that call in extreme cases maybe repeat instances where the same user keeps coming up day after day after day where you might um, subject them to um, uh, load limiting, you know, like um, rate limiting, or even in extreme cases, if your terms and conditions permit it, even confine them to a walled garden, give them access to some remediation tools, 
and the idea is not to punish the user, but to get them back online in a safe condition as soon as possible. But for the time being, you actually need to quarantine them off the network so that they can't go and do any further damage. And finally, there's a reporting function in there. It's not mandatory, but there we talk about if an ISP is aware of a level of network activity of compromise of sufficient degree, then they're encouraged to report that through to our national CERT. And the idea there is we've got an industry scheme now that for the first time gives the national CERT a snapshot of the health of the Australian networks at any given time. And that's a very, I think, a very good uh, development. It's one that our national security agencies support because um, you don't know when the country is under cyber attack. Otherwise, you, if everything's just looking at one part of the network or another, you, you need to have that overview. So that's what that element's about. Now, um, how's it going then after six months or so? Well, I can report that, um, well, we commenced on the 1st of December last year, so it's actually been in effect for about just over nine months, coming up to 10 months. Um, 34 ISPs have signed on. That might not sound like very much to you, but um, collectively they're over 90% of the Australian market because we've got the market leaders in there, we've got a couple of universities, we've got many, um, or a few medium sized and even some small ISPs that are all participating. And what's, I'll tell you about the feedback in a minute. In return for the signing up to the voluntary scheme, um, they get to wear the iCode compliant seal, and that is communicating to both the government, all the stakeholder groups and the user base that your ISP, this ISP, is following best industry practice in relation to how it is managing this very serious threat on its network. When you're signed up to the iCode, you can either remediate the customers by... We're not saying the ISP has the job of fixing the compromised computer. Let's be clear, we're not saying that at all. That's not their job. But we're saying at least let them know there's a problem and point them to some tools. Some ISPs are in vendor arrangements with vendors where they have bundled products and services. So they might say, OK, you've been compromised. Here are some tools that we recommend. You can buy them. And we have no issue whatsoever ever with this being a revenue earner for the ISP. If that's what, as long as there's a legitimate you know, reason for the notification, we don't want them to scare people for nothing. But, but we think that it's not enough to tell people you've got a problem. You've got to point them to the solution. Now, failing that, many of the small ISPs don't have the <laughs> means to develop uh, remediation strategies for their customers. The association developed the iCode website. And I'm not sure if you can see that very well from down the back, but what it really says is, here's some basic information. Why have you been directed to this page by your ISP? Secondly, it says, uh, what can you do? And then it gives you the option of self-help. And if you click on that tab, you can go to the website. I'll give you the URL at the end. You can just have a quick play. It's only about four pages deep. But the self-help gives you access to online diagnostic tools and online remediation tools. In some cases, they're free. In some cases, it's trial product. In some cases, you can buy it. But we've given people the option. And I think the one that we're most proud of is the next tab along the professional help. If you click on that one, it takes you to three companies that will actually come and do house calls. They'll drive around for a fixed fee. I think it's about $100. They'll go and look at the computer. They'll purge it, they'll, they'll identify the problem, they'll uh, patch the OS, they'll do whatever it needs to be done, and then they'll give the, you the option of uh, permitting them to remotely monitor and maintain the computer from that point on. And so they don't have to keep coming out all the time. And the beauty of this is that we've really targeted the least technically capable internet users, who we argue are the most vulnerable. You know, the late adopters, the grandmothers, you know, the people that don't have English as a first language. Those people that can't, if they get a warning email, figure out what the problem is, much less how to really fix it. So we built that into the scheme as well. And uh, the indications after nine months of the scheme are that the users are initially very surprised that they've got this notification. Almost t to a single case, no one realised they'd been zombied. Such is the nature of the threat. It's not evident. The second response following that is 
well, thank you for letting me know. So it's one of gratitude. It's a bit like, I don't know if many of you travel with credit cards, but sometimes the credit card company will call you and say, in my case, Mr. Cronus, we noticed that you're in, your card has been used for a transaction in South Africa this week. Are you in South Africa? And I go, well, as it turns out, I am. And they say, well, that's great. We'll just, when are you back? We'll put it on the file. Now, do I feel like my privacy has been invaded in that situation? No. I actually feel like it's great that someone is just making sure that my facility is being appropriately used. So that is the kind of culture that we're trying to build into this scheme. And I've got to say that the feedback from the user base is very much supportive of the fact that the ISP is taking these measures. Um, the Australian government has now in, has formally endorsed the scheme. They put out a publication uh, last year and they've reprinted a second edition this year. It's called Protecting Yourself Online. And in it is a page that talks about the I-code. And while you won't be able to read that text, the last three lines say, make sure you use an ISP that is compliant with the I-code. Look for the trust mark below on their website. And that's the kind of government, you know, private public co collaboration that I think really adds validity to what we've done. And it's the reason why the I-code is attracting attention all over the world now particularly from governments that are feeling frustrated that they can't solve the problem and they want to try and get industry on board to help. Now, you might say, well, why are the ISPs doing this? This is obviously a cost that they're absorbing. What's in it for them? And the answer that when I talk to the ISPs, they say, look, there's about three reasons why we do this. The first is because we don't want compromised computers on our network. They create bad traffic, and it's just a problem for us. Secondly, they culminate in higher customer calls, support calls to us, because you know people suddenly the computer's very slow, and they assume there's something wrong with the connection, and it ties up all our support people. This way, we can <coughs> minimise the number of support calls, and the participants are reporting that the rate of, of calls into call centres has dropped as a result of this I-code initiative, certainly in relation to those kind of problems anyway. Um, thirdly, they say we've got this issue of blacklisting still with um, the self-help you know, spam responses that we've seen globally for a long time. You don't want to be identified as a source of spam. To have a customer whose computer is a spam bot because they've been zombied is not a good look and it just is inconvenient to have to go and get yourself taken off a blacklist, as I'm sure some of you have probably had to do in the past. So for those reasons, the ISP say, look, we actually support this. We've made the business case internally. It wasn't that hard to do. Frankly, we don't have a high level of botnet activity. Oh, next time I come, if I'm invited back next year, I'll have some good statistics for you. That's an inducement for you, Ant. I can give you some metrics by then about the level of remediation that's occurring. But I can tell you anecdotally in the nine months to now, uh, we've seen a gradual decline. The number of daily reports of active zombies has dropped from about 16,000 last year down to about 11,500 this year. That's average per day. But you still have spikes. There are good days and bad days. But the overall trend is trending down. So that's, that's very good. We're encouraged by that. Next steps. Where do we want to go from here? Well, um, this afternoon we have our, um, I think it's our third or fourth uh, annual meeting of the Internet Industry, International Internet Industry Alliance, of which ISPA is a founding member. And uh, we are talking now about how do we take these best practices and share them. Similarly, we're having discussions in the US, in the UK, in New Zealand, and the vision is to try and globalise this scheme not necessarily to dictate how it must be done, but to at least share our experience and encourage uh, similar measures to be taken in other places. And the idea is, because it's a global phenomenon, you need to have a global coordinated response. And that's where we'd really like to take this. So we'll see where it le leads up. But I think the key point for the ISPs in the audience is to understand that this is a good thing to do for your network, it's a good thing to do for your customers. Um, it's supported by government, supported by law enforcement. 
If you're on the front foot with this, we've actually seen it as a defensive move against other regulation. We'll do this stuff, don't make us do that stuff. And, and to some degree, that, that's a very positive takeout. That's the URL I mentioned. If you go to ico.net.au, that'll take you to the website. You can have a little play in there. That's the kind of thing that we want to see happening more internationally. And the more that we can have consistent, harmonised messages, and maybe even the brand itself being uh, recognised as an international brand, then I think we've made very good progress. Thank you, Mr Chairman. Um, I'd like to ask a question which was partially touched, touched on this morning, but uh, because of your focus in this area, I request a comment, and probably somebody in the audience can give me a more concrete answer. This country's not the only one in the world, but we've got a lot of corruption. And we've had whistleblowers, basically, and these have led to stories that have been published. Mm -hmm. Now, there's a threat to that activity because there's a so-called secrecy bill in Parliament. That's the journalist's name for it. They've got a long name for it. But OK, it seems to be, th it, it, it clearly threatens any whistleblowers mm. in government departments and threatens any journalist, anybody who publishes what the whistleblower tells them. Now, the immediate thought that comes to mind is, you know, if you cannot publish in, on paper, you can actually publish it in some remote website. Mm. Now, the question is, um, this is a threat hanging over our heads and it would obviously affect the whole internet if they do that, if they try and pursue it. So the question is, is a comment from you, sir, and possibly an answer from the audience. Is that a real threat and do we have to make sure that we try and prevent it? Thank you. Well, look, I don't know if it's appropriate for me as a visitor to comment on government policy in your country except to say that in other jurisdictions that have attempted similar things, and I'm thinking of China in particular, you have to ask the question, how successful have they actually been since the advent of the internet? And I think you've also seen the whole WikiLeaks phenomenon as well. So the internet, you know, this information strives to be free sort of maxim that accompanies the internet, or at least is advocated by the free speech advocates is an attribute of the internet itself. It is built into this fact that it is global, it's distributed, it is not subject to centralised control, as China has found. And therefore, I think that, let's just say that if it weren't for the internet, then these kind of issues become highly problematic. I mean, in some cases, they give rise to social unrest and worse. But I think because of the internet, the time has passed where governments can shut down discussion and dissent and dissemination of information. And I mean, if China can't achieve it, and look what happened in Egypt and other places where there are actually Iran, people's revolutions, all through SMS and social media and everything else, then I think that the internet really is the only hope that we have in maintaining free and open communications. Because unlike any other medium, it is not jurisdictionally based. You, you can't, you know, you can shut down a newspaper. You can take control of the televisions. This is what occurred in revolutions. You'd go and capture, the, you'd lock up all the newspaper editors and you'd send the troops into the broadcasting stations, start publishing propaganda. But the internet isn't like that, so I think that there is probably a degree of um, freedom that can't be impeached by the actions of individual government. Thank you very much, Peter. It's always Thank good you. to see you here. Thanks again. Thank you.